Thanks, Dale, and thanks everyone for your attendance today. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we're all standing and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Today's webinar is called Putting the Evidence We All Know and Some We Don't Yet to Work for Babies and Toddlers. Erasing our partners, MCRI, Families Australia, PIRI, Good Start Early Learning and Children's Healthcare Australasia are hosting the Early Years Summit just a few weeks from now. Today we're going to talk about why we need it, the opportunities it will present participants to make a difference in the lives of children, young people, particularly toddlers and babies. Today we'll hear from two key people from two partner organisations. Sue West is the Associate Director of Policy and Service Development at the Royal Children's Hospital Centre for Community Child Health. She is also co-group leader of Child Health Policy, Equity and Translation at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Dr. Brian Babington, who's sitting with me in the camera studio, is Chief Executive of Family, Chief Executive Officer of Families Australia. And Brian's got a very long and distinguished career advocating for family and child welfare in Australia and developing countries, particularly in Asia. I should also mention uh, our ACC Penny Dakin was due to be here with us today. However, due to a family bereavement, she's not able to be with us today, and our thoughts are with Penny and her family today. Today's format's a little different from our usual um, webinars. It's more of a discussion, uh, primarily between Brian and Sue. Uh, I may chip in from time to time, but as I say, as a poor proxy for Penny, I'll leave it to the experts. And to get the ball rolling, I guess I'll just start by asking um, these two key partners what it was about the summit, the need for the summit, the, the desired outcomes from the summit that has attracted their organisations <coughs> to join with a RACI and our other partners in putting the Early Years Summit 2020 on in March of this year, 11th and 12th of March of this year in Melbourne. Brian, would you like to kick off? Yes, thank you very much and hello everyone. Um, look, I think the summit's a really exciting opportunity and I first of all begin by asking everyone um, to please consider attending if you're not already registered for the event. Uh, I'd make three comments about uh, the importance of the summit. One is that uh, it's about the timing uh, of this uh, of, of the summit. The timing is absolutely um, critical. One of the things that Families Australia, I and the National Coalition on Child Safety and Wellbeing have been involved with over the last um, a year in particular has been to think about uh, the National Framework on Protecting Australia's Children's Successor Plan. The National Framework is a 12-year plan, as many of you will know, um, and it's due to end this year. So the Council of Australian Governments, all the state and territory and Commonwealth Governments are um, thinking about what should be in that successor um, plan for children and families. Uh, we've been doing a lot of consultations, but the first point I'd make is about this timing issue. Um, 2020 is a really important year in terms of gathering uh, ideas together, reflecting together um, and working with governments to develop uh, the best possible national um, successor plan that, that we can. This is where the summit fits into that thinking process um, with its particular focus on the early years. The second point I'd make uh, briefly is that we've been doing a lot of consultations over the last uh, year and people are telling us around the nation, we've spoken to over 600 uh, non-government representatives, government representatives uh, and researchers, uh, young uh, people, families uh, in rural, remote as well as urban areas and a consistent theme has been um, about um, uh, the early um, prevention agenda, the importance of um, strengthening our child and family support uh, activities, working together in greater collaboration across silos of sectors, governments um, uh, and, and disciplines to get a better integrated response um, for the needs of children and, and young people and their, their families. So we're hearing more about um, the early years through those consultations about how it's absolutely essential. The evidence speaks volumes um, of the need to really hone in our attention in policy and practice on the early years. Um, and so uh, the, the point that I'm making here is that the summit goes directly to this um, to this point that is being made so loudly um, by the people that we speak to in thinking about um, the Beyond 2020 agenda, as we're calling it. Um, the, the third point I'd make is, really flows from that, and the summit is bringing together um, an amazing array of people from a wide range of sectors uh, and disciplines. 
Um, now, this is what we need. We need greater collaboration. Um, we need um, the leaders, the thought leaders, but also the, the practitioners who know this stuff from, from their work in the field um, to come together uh, and to um, produce not just a, um, uh, a sort of a one-hit wonder summit or, or gathering, but the beginning uh, and the catalyzing of a moment that will lead on to the development of a national, um, we hope, decade-long plan uh, that focuses on the early years. So that's why we're here. Very excited about it, Paul. Thanks, Brian. It sounds like the timing is absolutely perfect. Sue, would you like to um, respond to that question as well? What drew MCRI to be part of the, the summit? Thanks, Paul. And um, what he said. <laughs> he said hello, <laughs> <like me. laughs> So we've certainly been. Um, uh, so, so before I start, I should actually acknowledge that I'm in Melbourne uh, today. My office is on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and the emerging leaders. And there's some absolutely fantastic work happening in Victoria, led by um, Aboriginal controlled organisations in Victoria and nationally. And we are um, really um, hoping that uh, some of those agendas connect up with ours um, uh, uh, and come into our um, broad agenda and that we can support their work going forward through this summit as well. Um, so in terms of um, uh, our work, I, I'm Associate Director at the Centre for Community Child Health, so a section of MCRI. So I, I can't say that I sit here representing all of MCRI, but certainly as um, MCRI is a child health um, research institute, one of um, probably Australia's largest child health research institute. The interest that the Centre for Community Child Health has had in recent years has been on this period of very early childhood development. So the period of um, from uh, preconception, conception through to the child's um, second birthday, and we've been referring to that as the first thousand days. And uh, we've done some earlier work in partnership with ERACI, with the with PricewaterhouseCooper, the Booper Health Foundation, and Booper the uh, Health health business um, in, under, in, in um, partnering with them on a um, strong foundations initiative we, and the MCRI deliverable on that was um, the synthesis of some significant evidence and some of which is uh, really new evidence and still emerging today around the importance of that period of development. Um, we know from that uh, research that uh, the first thousand days of, offers the first and probably one of the most important opportunities for intervention in terms of making sure that children um, uh, have experience and opportunity to develop well, which affects their, their um, trajectory across their, their lifetime. We know that kids in those, in those very early years who experience um, family violence, for example, or homelessness, or where there's suboptimal conditions throughout pregnancy, that uh, those kids who start behind tend to stay behind. So we were interested in bringing attention to, uh, to that area of focus and, you know, touches on um, the um, Families Australia interest in um, prevention, primary prevention, so intervening early to stop problems developing later. So through our partnership with ERACI and our other collaborators, we were really pleased to come together um, uh, uh, around this summit. From our first thousand days paper, we determined that there were three kind of strategies going forward, and one was to continue to synthesise the evidence and make sure that we have a holistic picture of what's happening during that, that first thousand days. The second is to communicate those findings um, to others and consider what they mean, uh, what the implications are for policy and for uh, practice, service delivery, etc. And um, and then the third area is to um, adopt strategies that that really go to the uh, causes of the causes. So what are the conditions under which families are raising children and the issues associated with that that we can address that are beyond, or well, services are obviously important, but what are the, what are the intervention points um, beyond services as well that can um, create supportive environments for um, and address some of the conditions that families face in, in those very uh, early days. So in my mind, that takes us to 
um, a holistic approach, it takes us to a multi-sectoral approach and a prevention approach. So those three things are really important to us and we see the summit as an opportunity to join with others from other sectors and um, other uh, disciplines and perspectives to address uh, and, and develop a blueprint for action going forward. Thank you, Sue. Um, I guess I'd summarise, uh, or, or I'll guess I'll open the next phase of the discussion by saying that I think one of the key drivers of this summit, Kenny puts it so beautifully, is that there's an enormous amount of frustration out there um, in our sector across the sectors and just amongst the individuals turning up to, to work every day, trying to make a difference and, and finding roadblocks. There's evidence, as Sue points to, that the first thousand days is. Um, so critical. I think Brian's just about to talk to some evidence about what's going on. There's an enormous amount of frustration that we, we have evidence. It's getting it into policy. It's getting it into outcomes. Brian's organisation is doing a whole lot of work around that and of course this will feed into that. But Brian, did you want to talk to us about what the current state of play for kids is in Australia? Yeah, well thanks, thanks Paul. I'd just make a few general comments and try to take a sort of broad national, national view of, of things and um, I suppose it's become a common cliche that um, uh, most children in Australia are doing pretty well. Um, but the reality is, as we well know, that clearly a lot of kids are struggling. Um, this uh, last week, I was struck again, as I am about this time each year, by the release of official um, figures uh, that take uh, both a national look at um, child protection uh, a range of data on child protection, but also it drills down into what's happening in, in uh, various states and territories. The report on government services by the Productivity Commission uh, report last week, uh, again, painted a, an appalling picture uh, that we are simply not getting ahead um, of um, uh, the wave uh, of, of deep concern, if not crisis, on, on aspects of child abuse and neglect. Let me just give you a couple of, of figures. Um, what we now see um, is a threefold increase in the number of children in out-of-home care uh, in the past 20 years. Now that's gone from around 14,000 20 years ago to now, and this is only data that's six months old, um, to 44,906 children and young people in out-of-home care. The Australian population is not growing at that rate. Um, you know, clearly we're, we're just not doing something right here. Um, let me give you some of the other figures. We, we see that in the past decade, there's been a 50% increase in the number of substantiations of child abuse and neglect. Um, we, we now see a, a not only the notification, which is a larger number, uh, often in between two and 300,000 per year, but in terms of those cases that are investigated and substantiated, uh, last year, it was over 47,000 substantiations. Um, I also want to touch uh, briefly, um, because it is so critically important to highlight uh, the, the concerns of Aboriginal children, families and communities. Um, we, we see year upon year that there is a massive disproportion in the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children um, who are in out-of-home care, for example. Um, the rate at which um, Aboriginal children are in out-of-home care is now 10 times the rate as it is for non-Indigenous uh, children. All of this taken together, if you look at the, the whole national picture on, on child protection, the national spend has now reached over $6.5 billion per year. Last year, it was $5.8 billion. It has grown in real dollar terms by 10% in one year alone. The previous year, it grew by 10% in real terms in one year alone. 60% of that $6.5 billion is going to run the out-of-home care system, if I can call it that. Clearly, those numbers um, financially is one thing, but the human scale and the cost of this is unsustainable. And um, I suppose it speaks to that, again, that moment um, where we have to um, really redouble our efforts to try and turn around um, the, this, these appalling figures. Um, so I think the summit, coming back again to that, um, uh, I know the summit uh, will be 
um, not just focused on child protection matters, it'll take um, broader um, uh, issues into account, a whole range of issues, and I hope it does. I mean, that's the great thing about the summit. It'll, it'll be uh, an opportunity for participants to raise the issues um, that, that are deeply concerning and worrying them, bring those to the attention of the, the summit, and they, those things will be then put into, um, I think it's a charter manifesto, what, whatever the outcome is, um, to try and give a more rounded picture um, of the issues facing children uh, and young people today. Not just the, the things of, of deep, deep concern, but also the things that are going well. I mean, you know, I think we're looking for a balance here as well. But in terms of a summit manifesto, then drawing attention of policymakers um, to those things that need attention, that's going to be the real task of the summit. Thanks, Brian. Sue, did you want to wait for that? Oh, I guess I'll only um, add to say that we know now consistently from several ways of data collection, um, the ADC, ADI, ADC, that 20% um, of kids start school developmentally vulnerable on one or more developmental um, outcomes. And that, that number isn't shifting. And in some communities, uh, that rural and very remote, those figures are as high as um, one in two, so 50% of kids. We also know that um, that some of that uh, vulnerability is clustered in locations of disadvantage, and uh, there's a real equity issue that we need to address here. Uh, the other thing um, that I would add is, um, I forgot what I was going to say, there's another comment I had following um, Brian's, but look, I might leave it there. But just to say um, that that 20%, some, some of those 20% are the same kids that Brian's talking about um, that are ending up in, um, in out of home care. I, I, I believe that they're, they're the same kids. So intervening early um, prevention is really, really important, um, important work. Indeed, I mean, there was a, there was a report that came out late last year that CoLab and Woodside and others contributed to that showed that the cost of late intervention for children and young people is a billion a year. That's that's twice the amount of what we're exporting wheat. So you know, every wheat, everybody involved in the wheat industry twice over might as well not get out of bed. Um, it's it's a, it's massive and that's just the direct cost. What what's not costed in there, what they weren't weren't able to model is is all the knock on costs of, of, of you know, lost productivity and so on. This is just the direct cost of looking after those children and young people that have been helped too late. <laughs> 15 billion a year. Um, so, you know, I think, and you guys have both touched on it, I think I think there's actual, beyond the human cost, which is all immeasurable. Uh, when we're talking to government, when we're talking to investors, corporate or philanthropic, um, the, the, the economic case is really important and really strong. And hopefully at some point, you know, it, it's it's a very difficult thing for for this sector to do, but I thought I think that CoLab report was a good first step in, and so was the PwC report that we were involved in, costing um, the damage done when children don't grow up in stable housing or, or when their mothers aren't supported to stop smoking during um, pregnancy. That, that those sorts of economic arguments just need to be made because in one sense that's all politicians and it's all investors understand, and and taxpayers, you know are not unexpectedly looking for a return on their investment. So, um, you yeah, know, I think that's, I think it's actually, I think sometimes we shy away from putting a dollar figure on these things, but the reality is it's something we need to discuss. Um, all right, I, I guess the next two questions kind of bundled together, and I, I won't leave you guys to really uh, discuss them, but there is a bunch of evidence that we just touched on. The evidence of the importance of acting early and the evidence that um, there is work to be done. Uh, and yet these two, you know, these two bits of evidence are around there and they're certainly building pieces of evidence. Um, why is it so difficult to get any movement? Sue, Brian, do you want to go first? Well, it, it, you know, in some ways that's the question for the summit. This is the purpose of the summit is to say, or, or what sits behind the summit is to say that what we've been doing isn't working. And, uh, and yes, we have evidence around the problem and we have some evidence around uh, what to do about 
when the issues are simple, but actually many of the challenges facing um, the families that we're talking about are, are complex and, and wicked problems. And so they require uh, a different approach. And in my mind, that's, that's the opportunity of the summit. Um, and it's not as simple, therefore, as just putting evidence into practice. But if we're really going to address those complex issues, um, then we need to address some of the, as I said earlier, the conditions that are keeping this disadvantage in place. And we need to adopt a systems approach. And uh, the summit is the opportunity to do that. Um, we, I think one of the um, things is that we need to um, change behaviours and mindsets. Um, and if I can give a little plug for um, to the two pre-summit workshops that we are hosting the day before the summit, one of those focuses on relational practice. So we think one of the behaviour changes that's important is the way in which we we um, partner with um, families and uh, parents and carers of children in um, the uh, in the service system, uh, ensuring that they are um, heard and actively engaged in um, designing and at times co-delivering and participating in um, the the um, solutions to the to the issues that they're facing. And the second. Um, a pre summit workshop is the um, what we've been learning around the evidence of the first thousand days, which I touched on in the beginning, but we'll certainly be going deeper on that. So changing behaviours and mindsets is is one thing, um, and related to that, and related to um, the issue of relationships, is changing the um, the, the power dynamics uh, that exist. And, and none of this is simple work. If it if it was, we would have done it by now. And um, you know, I've been to a number of conferences and uh, workshops and things like that that have made these sort of claims. If it was simple, we would have done it by now. And I guess as an organising group for the summit, we see ourselves as um, catalysers to say we're not. This isn't starting from scratch. This is um, building on some excellent work by the Front Project and the Netherlands Society and all of the um, telethon kids and, and um, all of the good organisations that we all know about who are all either panellists or um, um, thought leaders at the summit, let's build off all of that and, and let's see if we can have a go at doing something different that's about addressing this, uh, the problem for kids in early childhood as a, as a systemic um, as, as having its basis in systemic issues. So we need to address things like the flow of resources and we need policy and practices that are keeping these problems in place uh, to shift. So as much as we are seeing ourselves as part of the solution, um, I suspect if we unpack that, we're, we're part of the problem. So how do we understand that and how do we change uh, what we do individually uh, in our practice and what we do collectively as, uh, as a group? It requires a cross-sectoral approach and a multi-level approach. We know that, as I said earlier, that if we think about a, a child and the conditions in which they're being raised, then we, we have to talk with people in the housing and homelessness sector we, in, and in the hospital system and every place that touches children or has the potential to make a difference to children's lives are all part of that system solution. Um, and evidence is, is important to this process. We need to make sure the evidence is um, used where it's available. And we also need to continue to learn and innovate and improve and scale when we do, we're doing things that are showing promise. So, um, I, I, Brian, what, what would your response to that question be? Yeah, um, I, I, a couple of things occur to me. And, and I, I, the question that, that hearing you talk comes to my mind is whose responsibility is it? Um, you know, very often we look um, almost exclusively to governments um, to uh, adopt policies, um, uh, you know, and we sort of say, well, why don't you get the evidence? Why don't you understand this? Why don't you prioritise this? Um, and, and, and I sort of, having also been, spent a bit of my career inside government as well, um, you, you can sometimes see that governments are not just don't have all the levers. Um, they've got many levers, but it's something, this is an issue um, that we've been talking about, about child wellbeing, uh, with a focus on the early years, that really requires a community-wide response. 
Um, you know, I still tend to believe, I, maybe I'm naive, but I think politicians, uh, good politicians do respond um, to community will. They, they're sensitive, uh, or they should be. Um, good politicians are sensitive to what they're hearing in the community. And, but I think we need that community voice to sort of speak up. Um, and we need the sort of broad, uh, sort of waterfront, if you like, of opinion that starts to talk more about the role, uh, the valuing of children, the nurturing of children in our society. One of the really important themes that's come through for us in the last year of our consultations around the country has been around valuing children. And, um, and why is it that as a nation, many, many people feel we're just not doing enough and that if we were to have a, a, a greater debate and, and a depth of understanding and reflection, thinking together about that, that is just not um, a, sort of a political thing, um, that, that it's not just the onus of politicians, but that we all sort of own that conversation. Um, we'd go an awfully long way to um, changing away a, a, around the way our society um, thinks and values. This is about national identity. And I think that my thinking about the summit is that this is a good opportunity um, uh, to unpack some of these things about what sort of nation do we really want um, in for our children to grow up in. I mean, I think that as a parent, I mean, you know, what sort of nation am I with my limited capacities leaving for my two sons? Um, you know, and uh, and I'd love to have that conversation at the summit. It's about values, identity. Uh, unless we get those sort of basic settings right, I think we can do have all the policies and actions under the sun, but they sort of won't relate to our essential DNA. In the and and I don't think there's one national identity. I think there's a multiplicity of those things. That multiplicity speaks to the complexity of the issue as well. I think we've got to help politicians out. We've got to help policymakers out in lots of lots of ways. Yeah. Thank Can you, I add to that, Brian, and, and say um, that, you know, it's, it's, I think we uh, need to be, bring into this discussion the whole issue of climate change in Australia and the impact of climate change in Australia. And I was really struck last week by Greta Thornburg's um, uh, speech to the World Economic Forum um, at, at Davos last week where she said, act as if you loved your children above all else. And I thought that was, that's, that's I want to use that as my mantra from now on because it, it, that's, that's what it's actually about. Uh, and here's a young person saying that to our world economic leaders. And I think that's what we want to say together here as well is, Act as if you loved your children above all else. What what would that look like for Australia's children? Yeah, that's great. Um, that's great. And I, I don't know that. I think Brian was, you know, what I, when Brian was talking, I was thinking about you know, whose responsibility is it, and who can do what. And the government doesn't have all the levers. And I've, I've spent some time in government myself, and it's very easy for people to come knocking on the minister's door and saying, "I want money for this. We need, you know, you need to fix this. You need to invest in that." Mm. And uh, Brian's right, um, ministers and departments do need, it's, it, it's much better if there's some solutions or some, some guidelines and you know, some, some sort of clear thinking that can help them understand you know, how it's going to work and what they might get in return for their money and who else has got skin in the game. Yeah. Um, so um, I think, yeah, it, again, I think the, the, the summit will give an opportunity for people to think about how they can work together to get beyond that potential of just going to the minister and saying, mm -hmm. you need to do this it's more. We can do this with you, minister. Yeah. And just building onto that point, I mean, I think um, it's about telling the story in in um, maybe new, compelling ways. Um, you mentioned the economic argument. Absolutely. Um, the work of the Frameworks Institute, we were talking earlier about um, this really interesting research, very compelling research um, that, that really strongly suggests that um, uh, that families, parents receive messages about um, being, a, 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 with caution, say better parent, but but better informed, you know, in their choices and the way of of, of parenting. Um, th they receive those messages um, in different ways, and sometimes we don't know. Um, it's rather obvious to practitioners um, who are sort of, you know, imbued in the in the knowledge of their, their subject and working with families. 
but I think it's about telling the story and framing the story differently um, for different audiences. And, and I do think that we've got a responsibility um, as uh, whether it's non-government um, representatives or researchers or governments, uh, rep, you know, officials to, to sort of think about how other people are hearing what we're saying and and really be very introspective about that as well. Yeah, yeah. I'd absolutely agree with that and say and add to that to say that um, one of the potential uh, problems is framing messages in a way that parents believe it's all their fault if things don't work out or if things are, are, are difficult and um, and I think that's the wrong message. Yeah. Yeah, um, all right. Uh, maybe we should talk a little bit about how the thing's actually going to work, yeah. how we see, because uh, there'll be some people here that are wondering whether or not they want to come along to the forum, uh, sorry, the summit, and, and wondering, you know, how, how it'll work. So, um, Sue or Bron, why don't we like to kick off talking about how, what the mechanics look like and what someone would experience when, they, when they're there? Right. Yeah, Sue. sure, a really great morning tea. Uh, no, the, um, we have designed the summit to be very participatory, and there so there are three types of input that will um, contribute to the what we're seeing as the um, the output, which is a um, a, a um, gosh, I've forgotten the word. I don't know what's wrong with me today. Um, an action plan for going forward, a blueprint. Um, and those those three kind of inputs are uh, a series of um, panellists. So across the days there will be three panels um, that will address one question each. And um, Paul, you might like to say a little bit more about that. The, we then will have a series of thought leaders who will be um, having an opportunity to to um, share with participants their particular perspectives um, after each of the uh, panels at small, smaller tables uh, and where there will be deep table discussion on the, um, the issues that have been raised by the panellists and thought leaders. So we see it as every, that, that in fact everybody who comes into the room has something to offer and something to learn and uh, we're, we've designed an experience and a process to ensure that that uh, takes place. So the panellists in some ways are, um, provide some provocation for the discussion and then the thought leaders uh, will uh, share their perspectives with tables and there'll be um, an opportunity to go deep in the, in the discussions and the conversation will build over the days. Uh, so the um, conference organising group will be, uh, sorry, the summit organising group will be, um, you can tell we're much more used to running conferences, can't you? But we've been very, very deliberate to design this not as a conference. So you, what you won't hear is lots of people getting up and talking about or providing a paper on a particular program or project or research piece. That's absolutely not what this is about. This is about taking a much bigger picture look at what's happening in Australia, what's working well, what are our blind spots, what are the things that we need to give attention to and um, how can we do better? Mm. Yep. Yeah, I, I couldn't have said it better. I think um, to me the ex really exciting thing about the summit is uh, the uh, coming together of people who will bring their issues to the table um, and be able to talk um, with peers um, about th those issues. Um, the, the challenge for the organising group uh, is to try and uh, bring together um, throughout those two days and by the end of it, um, uh, a, a sort of a more of a synthesis um, and a sense of uh, which way to go forward after this. As I said earlier, uh, we're not looking uh, at this summit as being um, just a one-stop shop and, you know, thanks very much and, you know, you'll hear from us in due course. Um, uh, but we'll be guided by you about what those next steps should be. I mean, we don't have a roadmap here about what those next steps should be. It really has to be in the zeitgeist of the, of, of the summit um, about how, um, you know, how, how inspired people are um, to, to go forward, what a, a, a next 
um, what a plan of action might look like. I mentioned earlier, um, we've been talking about a decade-long plan. Um, other people may have other ideas. They might want to think about a, you know, a longer, longer plan or, or something different. Um, you know, we very much are an open book on this. Um, our key um, sort of aim is to bring together um, leaders, um, people who want to um, to discuss these critical issues. Um, at a time, as I said right at the beginning, that I think is absolutely um, is, is right and um, the moment is now um, for, for these sort of discussions to occur. So um, I can only encourage people again to, uh, to please come along and spread the word amongst their colleagues um, about uh, registering for, for this event uh, as well. Uh, I'll follow Sue as well and just say a little plug on the day before on the 10th of March, um, uh, there is a gathering of the National Coalition on Child Safety and Wellbeing. We have a, a, a gathering every year um, and um, this is a chance to talk more specifically about the national framework on protecting Australia's children. So it has that more, that particular focus um, what, where, um, why we decided to have the, the two things together with the, the annual coalition meeting on the 10th and the, um, the summit, the early year summit on the next two days was because we see these events as 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 really intimately joined. Um, the early years discussion of the summit, we think, will form a very important part of our advice ultimately to governments about what ought to be in the successor national plan on child safety and wellbeing at the end of the year. Yeah. Can I um, add that and just say yeah. that um, the group that's organising or the partners organising the summit have committed to ongoing, um, ongoingly to participate in a um, catalyzing group so uh, to carry actions forward and we'll be inviting others to join that group. We don't actually, we're not, we're not clear on what the, the, um, the task of that group will be other than to kind of pick up uh, where the summit leaves off. So as Brian said, it not, it's not a one-off thing, it's, it's the next step for the field in terms of what happens next. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I was distracted by reading some of the questions that are coming in and please send your questions in. Um, I'll just point out that a lot of the questions are going to, do we believe this is important or that is important? I think, uh, and I guess I'm reiterating what Brian and Sue have already said, that's really, that's that's to be determined in the hothouse of ideas and activity that, that the summit's going to be. That's, I think it's pretty fair to say that we've all got a reasonable idea what the evidence is telling us so far, but um, in terms of what, you know, how things are going and what works for children and where the roadblocks have been. But I think that the real, the real important part, the real energising part of this summit is that we hope delegates are going to turn up and share amongst themselves and decide amongst themselves that we as a collective can decide these are the things that are important, these are the blind spots in the evidence, this is the evidence we want to push, these are the issues that really need to focus we think some some wins can be made. Uh, someone's, you know, in one of their comments or questions on has come to us and said um, policymakers and investors are, are often looking for a, a quick outcome and we know that's true. And as a sector, we may need to give them some. Um, in order to win confidence and to, and to build that pathway to longer term reform. Um, that's politics. You know. um, federally, these guys are in the gig for three years and um, it's, it's, it's a reality. It's, it's the canvas on which we need to paint and we need to work out how we're going to do that. What I would add is that there are other um, investors in this space as well. So if I think about um, the um, Paul Ramsey Foundation, for example, and some of the other philanthropic organisations who are who actually do understand that this is long-term systems change, and are looking to invest in um, partnerships and collaboration that are focused on children and work at that systems level. So, uh, and and perhaps in spaces where governments are, are prepared to go that are more high risk. So. Uh, and, and there are some other philanthropists that come to mind for me as well. So um, I, I think that that's one of the opportunities that we that we have here as well, is that there are actually, and even in government and, and public servants, there are there is a great understanding that this is long term. It's probably at the political level that 
there's other um, imperatives that come into play. But if I think, for example, in Victoria with the um, Department of uh, Premier and Cabinet that have their place-based initiative um, just starting to um, emerge at the moment, uh, that is, those uh, people involved in a whole of government initiative certainly understand that this is this is long term work where capabilities need to be built, um, you know, over time. That where we're measuring um, change um, and that's about process, about how we're getting there, rather than just the metrics of outcomes. And have we in in our initiative have we um, changed outcomes for kids in two years? So I think I think broadly there's a, a greater sophistication. An understanding around that, and certainly uh, Change Fest uh, over in 2019 and 2018, as significant national events have um, their their manifestos uh, 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 with us and alongside us in saying that um, change takes time, and and those messages have been well received. I guess the 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 opportunity and the challenge is um, how to uh, continue to do the long-term work um, at, at the same time as you said, a uh, call of, of some quick wins, but but I guess that's, uh, they're all the things. I, I feel like I'm spooking a position now rather than, <laughs> rather than uh, but I imagine these are all the sorts of discussions that we, that we will have at the summit. Uh, even, I was going to say in, in relation to the question about, you know, do you believe in this should be included and that should be included? We've actually had those conversations in our, our um, partners group as well. So, you know, Piri has an interest in um, maternal and infant mental health, and we all agree that that's really important alongside many, many other issues. And that's, again, one of the challenges in addressing children and their well-being from a range of different perspectives is that we do need to be holistic and think about all of the different ways in which um, children's health, well-being, and development are impacted, and and uh, really take a holistic approach. And that's what we yep. aim to do at the summit. Yeah, um, but I think you know it's fair to say we want people to bring their positions and their opinions Absolutely. and their views with them. That's that's the point of the exercise. The more opinions, positions we can get in the room and discuss and see how they fit together and see who's left out and see who's well represented. That's that's where we're going to get the best picture of how we're going and it's going to give us the best picture of where we need to be. Um, I think another um, sector that, that uh, I, I suspect will be sadly underrepresented at this summit, based on what I've seen so far, we've had some questions about what sorts of sectors are coming in, I'll address that briefly, but um, you know, our whole society is based on um, a decent education system, a decent health system. Um, you know, all the businesses that set up here uh, benefit from from those things and you know if business can start to see for example if BHP and that, those sorts of companies can see that maybe the future workforce isn't going to be there because we're not getting it right the first thousand days and that's that's there's a you know there's a there's a wave there um you know they could be potential um allies that we haven't we haven't had before but it's again presenting them the evidence and making them understand that they've got a vested interest in this um so yeah, and there's, you know. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's an important role that the Front Project play in um, developing relationships with the business sector and 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 bringing the evidence to them about the importance of the um, of early childhood development. And uh, the Front Project have also had a leadership program to um, spark some um, advocacy and um, some additional work uh, across the field and they'll be present and engaged in this summit. So really what we want to do is think about how do we bring all of these different efforts that some of them are kind of all going in the same direction, some a little less, um, into uh, uh, something where we can leverage off uh, all of those opportunities that are presented across all sectors. And certainly, you know, our first thousand days work has been supported by PwC and Bupa. And we know CoLab have been supported by Woodside with their fabulous piece of work late last year. So some corporates are getting it and they're, they're happy to be involved, but it's a pretty small percentage so far. And yet they've actually got more skin in the game probably than they realise. 
Um, so look, there were just a couple of questions that I'll touch on and then Brian and Sue, please chip in if, if you'd like. Um, but we haven't asked what sort of sectors and interests are coming. Obviously, um, obviously we're getting a, a reasonable cross-section of uh, the sorts of people you'd expect in the early childhood sector, educators, we're getting um, medical people, we're getting policy makers. So we have got some government representatives coming as well. Um, so, and there's still, there's still seats left, so I expect that that will broaden. But we, I'd say so far, we're really happy with the cross-section that we're getting. I'd like to see more corporates, but that's, you know, well, let's see how it shakes out. Um, Brian or Sue, anything to add there? I just wonder whether you would like to say a little bit about the um, range of thought leaders and the, the backgrounds of thought leaders that are coming. That also kind of paints a picture of the diversity of perspectives and views that will be in the room. Well, uh, same to say, it, it, it's it's a galaxy of stars, basically. Um, we've got <laughs> thought leaders and panelists, 60 thought leaders and panelists. These are these are experts, and, and I, I can barely go. To, you know, I, I couldn't do them justice, but I encourage people to have a look at the website, early-years.com.au. That's early-years.com.au. If you just put that in, or just Google Early Years Summit 2020, um, and if you click on the People tab. Uh, we've got them, they're listed in alphabetical order, whether they're panellists or thought leaders. And basically what you'll see at the, at the summit will be, um, you'll, you'll sit at a table uh, with nine other people and a thought leader, or so eight other people and a thought leader, and uh, we'll get the discussions rolling with panel discussions. Um, the panels are five people uh, per panel, each is speaking for, 80, uh, for eight minutes, so 40 minutes in total of discussion to seed or, or a conversation to seed the discussion and then it basically gets thrown open to the room to, mm -hmm. to discuss among themselves and across tables, across work groups, um, what they got out of that, what was right, what was wrong, what was missing, how they see it, what, how they might like to advance that. And then that will all feed back into via some sort of technology that, I, that I'm not able to describe. Um, it will all be captured and, and fed back. So it's a very, it's it's not going to be an easy, it's not going to be a restful two days for those who come along. It's it's going to be a real opportunity to get in and um, hear some discussion and then contribute based on discussion and work in the work groups and tables that you'll be at. So, um, but yeah, I invite people, we, we have, we've got CEOs, professors, experts in the field, um, um, well worth, you know, have a look and come along and join us. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so the other, just in, in hearing that, I would say the other important people are obviously the people who are participants, the participants, um, because as I think Brian said at the beginning, it's going to be all, all of the different um, perspectives are going to be important. And, and, and what I would say as a way of encouragement is a really about how you turn up to the summit and I think um, we in a way are asking for you to turn up a little differently than you may then certainly than you would if you were attending a conference and you were going to be um, sitting and listening and perhaps doing some networking we really are um, as Paul said this this these are this is a working meeting um, but I would also say the other thing would be to be coming with an open mind all of us kind of come with our thing that we want to have uh, give focus to and um, get funding for and all of those sorts of things and um, and do more of. And the summit really is an opportunity to move beyond some of those assumptions that we make. And that's not to say that um, all of the things people might bring with them a bad ideas. That's actually not what I mean at all. But it's really saying what um, it could be. If if we thought that what we were doing worked, then we wouldn't be having a summit. So what what do we need to do that's different together um, that will well that has the, the possibility possibility of um, something much greater than we might have if we were just doing our thing and doing more of it. Yeah, it's a to, to to use a corporate phrase. It, this will be a disruptive thing. I think we're we're going to come out thinking what doing things differently to the way we've been doing. 
very much so. Um, so another question just popped in and I should address this, are there, uh, are there Etsy elders attending? Well, we've certainly got um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are on the panels. Um, I don't know off the top of my head whether thought leaders include um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They do, I'm being told. So I absolutely intend, obviously, especially given the stats that Brian talked about earlier, is to ensure that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice is uh, well and truly heard and participation is part of the, part of the, the um, summit. So thank you, Sasha, for that question. Um, we really don't have anything else. As I said, most of the questions we get at the moment um, are just do we do we support this or do we support that? And that really is a, that really is the work of the summit. Um, so I think I might at this point, Brian or Sue, have you got any final comments? Well, I guess I guess the person we haven't mentioned is Megan Mitchell, <laughs> who's doing our opening address, and I'm so excited about that. It's actually her last week in her position as Australian Children's Commissioner, and she has said to us that she's um, prepared to adopt a no-holds-barred approach to her address to the group. She's been um, in and around this field for some time, and I think that in her role as um, uh, Children's Commissioner, that she's seeing lots and I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say mm -hmm. as she um, leaves office and um, and I, I expect that to be um, both uh, thought-provoking and challenging and interesting and I'm really looking forward to hearing from Megan. Yeah I think I think uh, that should be pretty lively. Absolutely. Um, look a final comment from me I suppose is um, one of the things that's really driving me about the, the summit um, is the opportunity to be with, um, uh, I think it's probably about 400 people uh, that we're aiming for, yep. um, who um, who are involved in the same sort of thing. I mean, we're coming to it often from different perspectives, different dis disciplinary um, uh, backgrounds, um, but I think the common thing that, that people will be feeling and bringing with them is a sense of, uh, frustration that we're not changing things as fast as we want to for the better um, and a real um, drive to, to make those differences uh, occur. Um, I know from the conferences that we've run in the past and I know it'll be exactly the same in the summer, we will we will gain out of the conf our confidence by being around people who have the same motivations essentially that, that we have. Um, when, when I first came into my role now many years ago at Families Australia, um, I, I asked um, one of the sort of elders of the non-government sector, well, why do people keep turning up at these things? Why are they members of my organisation? And and, uh, and and this person said to me, well, because we run on confidence and, and this is a sector that joins. Um, we, you know, we support each other. And at the time I, th I took that comment away, I was thinking, uh, it, but it's, it's kept with me all these years that there is something about um, supporting each other, um, uh, building the networks, um, believing that we can change things for the better, um, and our frustration um, at what, what the problems that we, we, we see, particularly for uh, children and families that are experiencing disadvantage and marginalisation. Um, the inspiration that I know I'm going to get from the summit um, is going to be what drives me to, to get there and hopefully we can take that to the, uh, another another stage in developing something out of this, maybe a plan of action that does a couple of things. One will be, in taking Paul's earlier point, um, it'll be about that sort of long-term vision, about the sort of things that we, that about change, um, social change, policy change, um, the things that will take a long time. But at the same time, I'm sure that there will be things that are identified out of the summit that people can say, we need to get on and work on now that can be delivered in a shorter time span. Um, and, um, and I'm looking for both that practicality um, about um, those things we can do in the sort of more immediate term, as well as um, that longer term um, social attitudinal change strategy. Yes, and we have engaged um, Kerry Graham, 
a fabulous facilitator from um, Collaboration for Impact. So I have every confidence that Kerry will get us there. <laughs> As do I, and it's a beautiful segue into just mentioning that um, our next webinar um, will be, it's a, it's a companion to this and it's going to be delivered by Kerry and she's going to be talking about unpacking systems change. So um, I, I really encourage people to come along to that because she's again going to be outlining the kind of thing we're chasing in the summit, the, the type of work we're going to be trying to do. So I guess um, echoing Brian in particular, um, if you're frustrated and you want to see an outcome, the summit is the place for you to be because that's why we're all going. That's, that's the point of the show, that um, it is, um, you know, we recognise this frustration out there. We know there's work to be done. We just want to get the roadblocks out of the way as best we can and, and you know, make it better for all of us to turn up to work every day knowing that we're actually getting an outcome for young Australians. That's, um, I think that's why we all get out of bed and uh, that's the intent of this side. All righty, Brian, Sue, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for who's attended today. Thank you for your comments and questions. I hope we've dealt with them adequately. If not, please let us know. Um, please check out the summit website. Um, please check out the people who are coming and giving a contribution as thought leaders and panelists. I think once you've seen that, um, you'll be impressed and you'll um, you'll think that um, perhaps the summit is something you want to be involved in. So thanks again for everyone who's attended. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Brian. Thank you to our partners and we will sign off. Thank you very much.